Hello and good morning, and you're very welcome to uh, this morning's signpost webinar. We're coming to you from a rather breezy but dry west of Ireland this morning. Uh, good morning, Catherine. How are you doing today? Morning, Mark. How are things? Catherine, you're going to be helping us out with questions later on. So um, thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, we'll introduce our guests in a moment, but just to remind you that the Signpost uh, series is brought to you by Chagas Connected in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. So from time to time, we invite companies to the webinar to talk about their sustainability journey and why it's so important for them to pursue this journey. So this morning, we'll be hearing about the Keelings Fruit <coughs> Story, a family-run company that's almost 100 years old. And we're delighted to be joined by Des Ferris, who is Lead Director of Sustainability with Keelings Fruit. Good morning, Des. How are you today? Good morning, Mark. I'm very well, thank you. Great, great. Well, thanks for joining us today, uh, Des. Uh, we're re really looking forward to hearing about uh, the, the work that you're doing in Keelings to, to, to meet those sustainable sustainability targets. Perhaps, Des, you could just tell us a little bit about your own story and uh, how, how you got involved in sustainability in, in Keelings. Um, well, I've been in the food industry probably over uh, about 21, 22 years at this uh, point in my life. Um, I've been working with Keeling since 2015. Previously to that, I was managing director of a company called Nature's Best and Drogata, which you may be familiar with. And I was in a technical function there as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, over the years, I spent 14 and a half years there as well. So I have a real interest personally in sustainability. So as part of my function as, as technical facilities director here within Keeling's, um, I sort of put myself forward for it and said, listen, I'd like to lead this for the business and, um, you know, and deliver on the business purpose, which is better food, better world. And we're going to be talking about that today. I was very interested when I was looking up the, the just the history of Keelings, and you're probably going to cover some of this in your presentation, but is it 1926 since the, the company is in operation? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a fairly significant uh, time to be around. Uh, yeah, but... we're, we're, we're on the third generation of, uh, of, of the family business, you know, and, and, you know, the family are highly involved in this organization. You know, it's um, you have um, Caroline, who's the group CEO, um, you have David Mullion, and your father Joe, and and obviously the the mother in, in uh, as well in the background. So, um, I'm delighted to be part of this organisation. Um, what I like about it is a family business, and family businesses always make decisions for the long term. Yes, yes, I think that's a fair fair thing to say. Well, look, you have a presentation for us, Des. We might ask you to share your screen with us, and I'll um, do that for you now. Just, just to understand. remind everybody that uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel in a few days' time, as well as the presentation and um, the uh, podcast version of today's webinar is also will be available on whichever podcast platform that you use. Please do send us your questions. We have a Q and A tab that's. Uh, only delighted to receive your questions down the bottom and Catherine's going to be helping us with those questions later on so please do send us through your questions and uh, we look forward to a, a good discussion after <coughs> the presentation so Des I'm going to hand over to you for your presentation and we'll chat to you in a few minutes okay thank you very much good morning everybody um, I'll just take you through our journey on sustainability here at Keenings so uh, Keelings is 100% Irish owned. It's a third generation family business. And as Mark said, that we were first established in 1926. And that's a picture of the one of the original fields um, that they were harvesting our fruit uh, in at that particular time. Um, within the business, Keelings provides a range of services and expertise within fresh produce industry. So we are obviously, we are, we're a growing um, uh, business. Uh, we have our farms here locally and elsewhere, which we'll speak to you about in a minute. Um, we obviously source product from all over the world. And we have a sales function, when, and we have a marketing function, distribution function, and then we have an ERP solutions function, which is our Keenings knowledge business as well. So in Keelings, we have a number, uh, these are the business units that I'm just going to talk to you about at this point in time. So we work together as a one Keelings team with 11 unique business un units, sharing knowledge and expertise uh, with, with our colleagues and partners across the units. So within that there, we have the retail business. So the retail business is the business I'm sitting in today. Um, it serves predominantly the retail market here in Ireland, um, on the island of Ireland. We have a market business, which is 
I, I believe where the 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 first um, uh, market was um, uh, to, took place in, in in the city centre of Dublin. We have a flowers business that supplies flowers, uh, prepare flowers to the retail business. We have a UK business which is uh, fruit and salads and veg. We have a business uh, in Europe, Eurasia. We have a select business which is uh, provides business uh, food and and services to the um, food service uh, industry, hotels, restaurants, etc. We have a solutions business which is our ERP solutions business. So the the, the systems that all of our business units operate within Killings is designed and maintained by our solutions business. Yes, um, you might uh, just explain to us what ERP stands for, because I suspect you might be referring to it again in the presentation, just for, for um, viewers. Uh, so it's basically, it's it's how you manage product. Um, so the accounting system that manages product from our um, back doors to our front doors. So it's tracking and tracing um, the handling of product at every step in the process. That's ultimately what it does. Okay. Um, uh, again, and, and that's hand in, hand in glove with our knowledge business. And then we have our farms. We have our farms here in Ireland and we have our farms in internationally uh, abroad, which I'll take you through that in a slide or two uh, in a moment. So obviously our headquarters is in Dublin. We have 13 offices and production sites around the world. So we have, I say, our head office in Dublin. We have in the UK, we have in the Netherlands, we have in Paris, France, we have our uh, pineapple farms in Las Brisas in Costa Rica, our melon farms in Pura Vida in Costa Rica, and Belafonte in Brazil. So where are we today? Um, quite simply today, we farm over 2000 acres growing over 200 million strawberries, 16 million pineapples and 8 million melons uh, annually. We source from 46 countries and supply over 1,000 customers across 30 countries worldwide. And we employ over 2,700 employees from 58 nationalities across seven different countries. So it's, it's you know, sometimes when people ask me about Keelings, uh, you know, it's, it's at, at times because of the size of the organization, it takes a while to explain it to them. But as you can see, um, we're a global business. So I'll just give you a sort of uh, history wall of, 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 of how we got where we are today. So in 1926, W.P. Keeling purchased 78 acres in St. Margaret's County, Dublin. In 1937, 1945, we used growing strawberries and rhubarb and apples. In 1973, we opened uh, in Dublin in the wholesale market. In 1988, we entered the UK market. And then 1995, Killings Flowers was established in County Dublin. In 1998, Killings Solutions was established in County Dublin. And 2010, Killings launched our brand, um, which is that of the Grow brand that you see out in the retail market at this point in time. In 2012, Killings Knowledge was established. And 2014, 2020, International Farms Expansions in Pura Vida and Las Brisas in Costa Rica and Bella Fonte in Brazil. 2017, Keelings uh, Select was established in County Dublin. And then finally, um, in 2021, Better Food, Better World, Purpose, and New One Keelings logo was launched uh, across the business. So, excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. So I was talking about our growing operations. So in 1926, well, I say we, we established our farms here in Ireland. Uh, we grow now uh, over 4,900 tons of strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, apples, and cherries on 450 acres here in St. Margaret's in County Dublin. In 2014, uh, we established Pura Vida. Pura Vida grows melons and watermelons on a 200 hectare farms and we are we're the first Costa Rican melon farm to be a credit to Reinforced uh, Alliance. In 2017, Belafonte was established, produces a wide variety of melons and watermelons on a 2000 hectare farm in northeast of Brazil. And most recently, Las Brisas, which is based in Costa Rica, produces over 16 million pineapples a year 
on just over a thousand hectares of farm and has achieved an A rating for Rainforest Alliance as well. So our purpose as a team, we continue to strive to make food and what we, uh, sorry, and what we all eat better uh, through what we grow and the quality improvements and innovations we make and the stories that we tell. So we're all very aware here in Keelings of our impact on the world, both environmentally, socially, and are very uh, consciously planning to positively manage our impact on the world in the present and consistently into the future. Now our purpose, the logo that we established uh, to help people identify with our purpose has been carefully designed and crafted, uh, crafted to represent our purpose. So the globe style logo represents our commitment to a better world. The colors of the logo represent soil, plants, water, and air, the key elements in growing of our food. And the Keelings hands represents our care for the world and the food uh, that we create in it. So our vision is that we inspire more people to enjoy fresh produce. Our mission is that we sustainably grow, source and market quality produce by investing in our people, ways of working, insights, and partnerships. And Keelings, we have values, our values at Keelings are people matter, teamwork, passion for achievement, and integrity. So with people matter, we support and treat each other in a clear and fair and respectful way. We all learn, develop, and encourage everyone to contribute. With regards to teamwork is that we inspire and help each other to deliver our ambitions together as one Keelings. When it comes to passion for achievement, we motivate ourselves and each other to achieve our ambitions with energy, knowledge, and courage. We are always striving to be better. And lastly, when it comes to integrity, is that we do the right thing and deliver on our commitments. When Keelings, we have six strategic priorities. We have better food, we make our products better and inspire more people to enjoy produce. Better world, which I'm here to speak about today, is that we'll improve our environmental and social impact to make a positive difference in our world. When it comes to people, is that we support our people to learn, be at their best, contribute and deliver on their commitments using one Keeling standards. When it comes to partnerships, working with Keelings creates value and long-term relationships with our customers and suppliers. Better ways is every year we improve our competitiveness, efficiency, and deliver through insight, technology, and one Keelings. And lastly, growth. We invest in and deliver insight-led, focused, profitable growth into the future. So as a snapshot, this is our future. So you have better food, better world, our purpose at the very top. Our vision is that we inspire more people to enjoy fresh produce. Our mission is that we sustainably grow, source, and market quality produce by investing in our people, ways of working, insights, and partnerships. Our values, as we've spoken about, is people matter, teamwork, integrity, and passion for achievement. And our six strategic priorities is better food, better world, people, partnerships, better ways, and growth. Excuse me. So within the business, we use this format to describe to our employees better world. So our purpose in Better World is Keen is committed to protecting our environment and supporting our people and communities to make a positive difference in the world. Now there's five pillars that drive Better World, climate change, sorting the materials, biodiversity, community health and nutrition, and people. And within each of these pillars, there are themes. So for climate change, there's greenhouse gas emissions, energy and logistics, for sourcing the materials, it's packaging, responsible sourcing, waste management, 3PL. For biodiversity is 
deforestation in ecosystems, farms management, pollinators, water, soil, uh, water and soil health. In community health and nutrition, it's about charity, community engagement, health and nutrition. And it's in people, it's about believing, belong, and building one feelings. So when we look at our ambitions within each of those pillars, our ambition uh, in climate change is for 50% reduction in our emissions, our operations emissions, by 2030. If you compare that to a science-based target that we will be setting, that is actually uh, more aggressive than the science-based target requirements for that period of time. We are committed to a science-based target. We have written to science-based target initiatives, uh, registered our commitment, and we are committed to setting that target in the next 12 months with them, including the decarbonization program with suppliers. Um, as part of that journey and towards net zero, um, we will assess carbon offsetting options. Um, and finally, we have set ourselves an ambition to be net zero by 2040. When it comes to sourcing and materials, consumer packaging to be 100% recyclable by 2025, reduction of plastic intensity used in weight by 10% by 2025, and we want to be a leader in delivering sustainable packaging solutions across all of our operations. When it comes to biodiversity, um, all killings farms to ensure that they're accredited to sustainable agricultural standards. And by 2022, Killian's biodiversity policy and targets are to be in place, which I can confirm they are, which considers water, farms, management, soil health, pollinators, deforestations, and ecosystems. When it, come, pardon me, when it comes to community health and nutrition, we will invest a percentage of our net profits equally to achieve these objectives. We'll invest in research and innovation and communication to increase per capita consumption of fresh produce. We will increase accessibility to better food and support for the communities in which we operate in. And finally, when it comes to people, we'll support our people to learn and be at their best and contribute and deliver on their commitments using one killing standards. And all of that is underpinned by our governance and resource and reporting and stakeholders and communications and systems and process that we have within the organization. And just a little update for 2021, Killings achieved a 24% reduction in our operation emissions. That's an absolute reduction in, in emissions against our baseline year, which was 2019. That's the year that we picked the, uh, across our entire business. So if you think about it, a few moments ago, I spoke about a 50% 50 per, 50 reduction by 2030. Um, we've made some headway in that by, uh, by the end of 2021. We're also responders to CDP, and we currently stand at a B score with CDP, and say we have um, we are planning to be a B uh, plus. We're actually about to submit by the end. I think it's by the twenty seventh of July. We have to upload our information um, for the last twelve months, and we'll do that uh, shortly. And we're trying to target a B plus and eventually an A. Des, and can again, you just explain to us what the CDP score relates to? So your carbon disclosure project, which is what CDP is, so it's best practice when it comes to um, climate management. So it covers value chain engagement and their targets. It covers your scope one, two, and three emissions. It talks about your risk management process and your risk disclosure and your opportunity disclosure. It talks about your governance within your organization, energy management, emission reduction initiatives, and business strategy and financial planning making climate uh, change uh, uh, an intimate part of what we do every day and being able to demonstrate that through their systems and structures when we respond back to them they have a very very detailed um, assessment and then you get a score from that so most newcomers would go into that at a, say at the d level and work their way up and we responded in that in 2020, we went in at a D level, and last year we came in at a B. So we're jumping quite rapidly because of of the commitments that we're making within our own organisation and the progress that we're making. Um, so it's 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 best practice. And again, 
Um, I spoke about the Science-Based Target Initiative. We committed to them in January 2022. They have um, confirmed that commitment. Um, they give you 24 months to come back with your target setting. Our, uh, our expectation is that we will do that at the end of this uh, particular fiscal um, ahead of, of the 24 months requirements. And we'll be on that journey also. I um, just want to give you something uh, with regards to plastic reduction. Um, obviously, um, as a business where we want to do our best when it comes to consumer packaging. In 2022, I can tell you the retail business here in Ireland uh, will remove 50 tons of plastic um, from our consumer packaging um, by the end of this calendar year. Um, in addition to that, we'll reduce um, the gauge of our netting. That will remove an extra uh, one ton of, of plastic. The hand wrap that wraps pallets will we'll also have reduced the gauge of that, and that's going to remove another, or reduce, should I say, another four tons of plastic being um, used within the business. And then we've replaced low density polyethylene toppers for our bumper boxes with now compostable material, and that's an extra ton. So within the retail business, we give you some insight. And again, across all of our businesses, this is going on. But I just thought, as this um, is, is to an audience here in Ireland, I'll let you know that we're over 50 tons of reduced to remove plastic within the organization in 2022, which is quite considerable. Um, excuse me one second. So when it comes to biodiversity, as part of our Better Word Pledge, Keynes is committed um, to driving sustainability through a greener, cleaner, more environmentally responsible approach to production of our crops and the management of our farms and facilities across the globe. So to support this, the business has joined with several overreaching uh, organizations and certification programs to validate our results. These include the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, for which Keynes has been a part of since 2019, Origin Green, their SHAS program, Food Cloud, CDP, and there's many more that we could talk about. We're constantly seeking out other organizations to measure and improve our sustainability uh, impact. And we are looking forward actually towards the task force on nature related financial disclosure initiative to create a continuously improving framework to assess our biodiversity risks and opportunities. So after introducing our own wildflower meadows on the farms, um, we wanted to share our expertise in wildfires and biodiversity with our customers and consumers. And in 2021, um, as you probably know, we launched our Keating's Great Rewilding Initiative. Now, the initiative aims to protect bees and other pollinators by encouraging people to dedicate a zone within their garden to rewilding. Um, as part of this program, we give away 100 million native wildflower seeds in 2021. And in 2022, we're committed to improving that and scattering 250 million seeds across Ireland. We've also provided seeds and information packed to 1,000 schools nationwide. And just to give you, within our own farms, you know, uh, pollinators and fruit go hand in glove, as they say, or hand in hand. And these are some photographs of our own farms where we've um, done that rewilding. And, and in some cases, we, we have a lot of these um, insect hotels about the place, just creating uh, um, safe places for uh, natural habitats within the within the um, the farms here in Ireland and elsewhere. I'd like to talk to you a bit what something is also dear to our heart: food waste. Um, for many reasons, uh, you know, we we know uh, on average food waste is, is causing about ten percent of the greenhouse gases uh, emissions. But also, you know, we support uh, many different charitable organizations where people can, act can actually get access to healthy, nutritious food through a, due to uh, no fault of their own and largely due to affordability issues. Um, and I want to give you a sense of the challenges the business has when it comes to managing waste with, across our own operations globally. And I've picked out three particular um, contributing factors that can that, that can impact waste. Climatic extremes is one. You know the old Goldilocks uh, scenario, whereby you know it's 
porridge is too hot or too cold. And, and within growing produce globally around the world, the same thing applies. If it's too hot, there's problems. If it's too cold, there's problems. If it's too wet or too dry, there's, there's also problems. And, and our, our, our partners and growers, including our own farms around the world, are continually looking at variety species um, to try and forecast what the future is going to look like and what those varieties would need to be in order to uh, ensure that they have a crop that can be harvested when climatic extremes um, happen. But when they do happen, they produce um, significant challenges um, for both our, our growers and our own farms and growers globally. And one of those challenges is with pests and diseases, um, and including you know, rots, molds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other challenge we have um, with that happened through Brexit and obviously through COVID, through the lack of, uh, of people being available to, to deliver uh, and drive Arctic trucks and strikes a, por a port is delays of ports. Our products, um, if you take, um, you know, fresh produce has to grow where the sun is. So in the winter, it's impossible to grow, for example, strawberries here. Uh, for the vast majority of it, you, you can't get extend seasons either side by growing in glass and so forth. But but for the vast majority of it, it's 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 hugely difficult and not impossible. So you go where the sun is. So if I give you the example of a strawberry coming from Spain, the south of Spain, and it takes possibly three days to get here on truck, that strawberry when it comes here will have a predefined shelf life based on the growing conditions in which. Um, and the harvesting conditions. Um, and for example, if it has four or five days of life upon arrival, if it gets delayed in ports for whatever reason, um, then the shelf life of that product, the time you have to use that product is massively reduced. And given the volume that we supply globally and here in Ireland, locally here in Ireland, that can create a lot of waste difference delays. Equally, with regards to diseases, you could have progressive diseases caused by climatic extremes. And they may not be visible to the eye when that product is being harvested and, put in, and being put onto a truck, but by the time it gets here, it could be quite visible. And again, these are stuff that causes um, uh, uh, waste um, for us within the business. Now we have systems and processes and people at source managing all of this and people here managing all of this, but it is in modern days with the climatic extremes we're seeing globally, it is a huge challenge for us. And that's something that we are, um, um, I suppose, managing on a daily basis. So when you're looking at a waste reduction plan and, you know, there's a difference between surplus food and waste. And therefore, when you look at a waste reduction plan, um, it's about defining a baseline year. You have to pick a year, and we in Keelings picked our, uh, along with our better world year of 2019, we picked the same for our waste. So it, it all ties together. So we define the baseline year, and I would encourage people who maybe are not looking at waste at the level that they should do or would like to, I say pick a year and, 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 and within that year, sc scope your operations and quantify the tonnage of food and associated ed in edible parts, because we have. And then express food waste as a percentage of the product ingredients handled by your business. As, uh, that's what we have done. Separately quantify the tonnage of food sent to redistribution centers, charity, animal feeds, et cetera. And describe the scope as we have a method used and the verification of that data is really, really important. So within Killings, when we're managing food waste, that's one that's some of the things that we've done. And key actions is that we make food waste a priority every single day. We work with customers and growers to provide greater understanding of challenges and, and, and adjust as required. And we amend transport routes to avoid port delays and also to avoid the possibility of containers being compromised. We look at variety selection improvement to maximize class one product and where weather ex climatic extremes have produced 
products with some sort of misshapes that would be classed as class two. Then we work with customers to maximize those sales so they don't go to the ground. And we work with local charities to provide access to quality produce. In 2021, we provided uh, in excess of 500,000 of portions of fruit and veg across all our uh, in the, to the communities across all our business units. And recently, we've um, we, we've tied up with um, uh, one of our customers, Tesco, in in the Stronger Starts program, where we're aiming to provide um, the ingredients that will produce over the next 12 months a million meals to those um, families and children in need. And we engage with local farmers so that res residual surplus foods can be reused as animal feed. And lastly, just one second. Lastly, I just want to give you an insight of what we're doing to educate our people. In 2022, we have devised a program, a training program, to help champion our better world, uh, better food, better world purpose. And this goes to every single employee has access to this and will be trained in, the, in, in these levels. So the program is to build our, our internal capabilities to deliver a better world program. Build a team of leaders and champions to manage and deliver and evolve our Better World program. Build a stronger base of awareness and understanding of Better World program across the business. And position Keatings to be able to measure and implement and deliver Better World targets. And I've given some examples of climate, biodiversity, plastic packaging, et cetera, et cetera. Enable the team with the appropriate frameworks and tools for effective implementation. And it takes a team to successfully communicate and motivate and engage with employees, suppliers, customers, and other stakeholders to deliver on the Better World program and to deliver on sustainability performance and value for the business. So within that program, there's three uh, levels. There's a Better World for All, and all Keelings employees will go through Better World for All. It's a multimedia content, employee handbook, e-learning programs, performing metrics, and regular events across our business. And within that there, there'd be an integral part of the employee induction program. There'd be a self-learning short uh, program for all. We'll build into employees development programs of performing metrics and KPIs on better world. There'd be two-way mechanisms for employees feedback and interaction, and it'll cover things such as our policy at targets, et cetera, et cetera. Then we're gonna have better world leaders within the business, executive a level, a business management, business unit management there, and leads across. So we have leads and coaches across the business units. And within that there, we facilitate in-person uh, in person leadership, sustainability development, learning programs on key topics linked to achieving our strategic better world goals. So we'll train leaders to be able to address measurement, uh, uh, implementation, communication, engagement, and reporting. Topics such as climate and carbon, uh, carbon biodiversity, circular economy, uh, 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 materials, regulation, and communications. And lastly, we'll have better world champions. And those better world champions will go on SkillNet postgrad uh, certificate uh, programs and courses. And again, covering broad sectorial topics on sustainability in food and drink and manufacturing. So, we are investing in our people to help us deliver on our ambitions for, for sustainability and better world. And that's it for me in terms of presentation and I'll happy to take any questions from you at this point in time and I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Des, and uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Lots of easy to digest, to digest uh, graphics there, so appreciate that. Um, Des, I mean, we, we, we have lots of questions coming in here and we get to those in a moment. And please do keep sending us your questions if you have a, a question you'd like us to, to put to Des. Um, in terms of the, you know, the main challenges for the fruit sector, I mean, you've outlined, you know, the disease aspect and the transport side of things. Um, around the carbon labeling and climate change side of things, what direction do you see that headed? Uh, over the next number of years. Um, is that something that Keelings has considered a, a, a carbon labor or to, to actually communicate that, that uh, the, the level of ambition or in, in, indeed the actual footprint of, of the product? That you're yeah, it's, it's interesting because there's been, um, we're working with our own corporate communications team now 
we're going to be updating our website um we're going to be updating our comms um externally to, uh outside the business and labeling is one of those areas that we're having a conversation and there has been attempts uh, across uh europe and in different countries to come up with something that may be understood um and i think it, it from Keating's perspective, I, I, I think it's something that we can contribute to, but I think it would be something that we'd want to be taken up as a national thing uh, rather than just a Keating's led thing, because I think we want everybody to be telling us, not just Keating's, about mm. what they're doing on yeah. climate, uh, you know? So, that, so, so, so we, well. we, we are we will not be fine wanting contributing to all of these conversations and, and coming up with something, but it should be a national thing rather than just a Keynes thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. And I mean, it has to be supported by um, an, a standard, we'll say, an, right, yeah. or an international standard. Now you talked about um, having, you know, sourcing food or, or fruit uh, from 46 different countries. Hmm. How, do, how do you manage that? Or how do you ensure that each uh, the farms that are within across those 46 countries are adhering to the uh, objectives or the the uh, the standards that you've set out uh, this morning well uh, uh, there's a number of ways that happens um it happens with in partnership with our retail customers and the farms themselves so within keelings we have our own responsible sourcing program within that um we, we bear in mind we're third generation family business and a lot of those farms have been with us for that period of time also so um we work with our growers on the ground looking to implement what we would what would be commonly known as a, a standard so we have brc for example for packing operations british retail consortium standards which is a globally recognized standard we have global gaps for the management of the farms and pesticide use. There's ethical standards out there as well, uh, such as ZX and, and some meta audits. And we continually work with them to ensure first and foremost that their practices are, are in line with those standards because you have to start with standards. Then we have teams across our own uh, business unit here whose job is to monitor, monitor and work with our growers. And work on specification requirements. So come up with the raw material specifications that would look at the variety, the intrinsic quality of that uh, product. So whether it's taste profile, whether it's color profile, whether it's defect profile. Mm -hmm. And we have, so we were people at source, people that here and with our supply chain partners, including our commercial teams, our sales and marketing teams and our customers, we develop programs with our growers mm. that assures them of volume, assures us of certainty. And we deal with all the climatic challenges and poor challenges in between. So it is partnership in its fullest and it can't be done without partnership. There's a, a concern at the moment as uh, food prices are heading upwards uh, with the obvious drivers from the, the Ukraine invasion and the, um, you know, the cost of energy um, that, that food, that the cons consumer is going to be looking for uh, us to, or for you to maintain your prices and not to be increasing your prices. Um, and of course the primary producer is, is getting very concerned about uh, that they're going to be the ones that squeezed as a result of, of this inflation and that, that that pressure will be passed back to the, the primary producer. And I appreciate that you're also primary producers, mm. but how, how do you uh, intend to maintain that, that pillar of sustainability uh, uh, within, the, the, uh, within Keelings? In terms of under the pressure, of, under the pressure of costs, is in terms of the margins that your primary producers will ultimately be getting to maintain a a fair price for the the uh, the primary producer. Um, at, at the end of the day, um, there is significant inflation. Everybody knows about it, and that inflation does have to be passed on. Um, you know, if if it's not passed on, people will go out of business. And therefore, 
there will be no food to to talk about. So inflation, by by its very nature, it has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And whilst businesses um, such as ours try to absorb as much as possible, there's there comes a point where you can't absorb, and unfortunately, just the way life is, it does have to be passed on. Mm-hmm. And we work with our customers to do that in in a manner that's uh, meaningful um, for all within the supply chain. Um, And within that, managing sustainability and delivering on our commitments is just a prerequisite. It has to be done. So it's, it's, you know, it's it's not subject to something else. It's something that is just has to be delivered upon. So we manage that within within the budget constraints that we have been given in any particular year or over any particular period of time frame. Okay. But inflation is real, and where everybody strives to offset it across the supply chains, whether it's in fresh produce, where it's in frozen, it's the same for all. But unfortunately, there's parts of that inflation where it's just not sustainable that you cannot absorb. And unfortunately, we live in the real world where consumers are going to have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's no, that's a fair, fair response. Um, Catherine, we better get to the questions. Lots of interest here in Des's presentation. Um, you're just on mute there, I think, Catherine. Yeah. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Maybe just while you get set up there, I just have another question for you there, Des, in relation to the, you know, the transportation of food from Spain. Um, we know that the Spanish, from talking to to farmers there, that they're 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 coming under pressure from a water perspective, and that uh, you know irrigation is is commonplace there for most production systems over there. You know, how sustainable do you see uh, us transporting? fruit uh, from across the world to to Ireland um, in in these areas of the world that are becoming increasingly impacted by climate change? That's a good question, Mark. Um, If I just talk about killings for a moment, like, you know, we we have farms in Costa Rica and Brazil were equally challenged as Spain is. And I think technology, you know, if you go... If you look back 10 years and you say, God, we made huge, significant jumps in technology in the last 10 years, even 15 years. And over the next 15 years, we're going to have even greater jumps in it. Mm-hmm. And I think time is our friend in this one as well, that technology will allow us to produce um, fresh produce in more sustainable way over time. And there is a lot going on with scientific institutions, uh, with manufacturers of, of certain technology that is looking at that for the future. And, and what our farms, which I, I don't sit within the farms business, um, they have a very significant investment program at looking at the future to say, well, how do we do this given the probability of where um, the impact of weather is gonna have on resources such as water. Okay, thanks, Des. Catherine, are you back with yeah. us? Okay, sorry, I had the button on my, my speaker hit. Okay. hit, hit. Okay. Uh, I just want to say thanks, Des. It's lovely to hear about sustainability from a, an Irish company that we're proud of and, and really want to be proud of. Uh, just uh, an interesting question there about packaging, uh, regarding packaging and product shelf life. How challenging are you finding the shift to sustainable packaging and away from the traditional plastic packaging? For example, is it impacting shelf life? And are you finding you have to change certain agronomic harvesting and processing practices to suit new packaging? That's a brilliant question. And um, we've done lots of trials on various types of sustainable packaging here. And we're actually in the middle of one at the moment. (laughs) So we are as well. Um, We have a program, a pipeline of sustainable packaging initiatives going on. Um, If you look at something like compostable, compostable packaging, or if you look at something such as even board paper. Um, our trials are shown is that, there, you know, it's a prerequisite that you don't solve one problem and create another. Yeah, it's really important that we don't solve 
or contribute to res resolving a plastic issue and then create a huge waste issue. Um, so we're, we're, we're mindful that anything that we launch to market will not create another issue for us down the track. Um, when it comes to shelf life, um, we're not seeing any significant difference at this point in time within their trials with the packaging that we are looking at at this point in time that is uh, alternative to um, uh, plastic. What the challenge is, is actually how it's more to do with an operational challenge rather than a shelf life challenge. So if you have 20 odd lines producing our plastic pullets at the moment and you want to convert that into a paper upon it. It's a, it's a reconfiguration of your operations. It's a reconfiguration how that product comes into you, how that product is assembled, how you treat, because um, paper, if it gets wet, for example, if it's the wrong type of format or structure of paper, if it gets wet, can obviously fall apart and create all sorts of challenges. You know, if you're going to pick something, uh, if you're going to harvest something into a punnet, a plastic punnet versus harvest something into a, 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 I'm just using this as an example, a paper punnet, there's lots of challenges operationally with that. So shelf life um, is a prerequisite. We don't want to create another issue. So anything that we will launch to the market will ensure that the shelf life is not compromised. The challenge is the operational challenges associated with that. Okay, thanks. Um, now, Des, I hear it and get it that you'll talk about the family company making decisions for the long term. And um, personally, I totally understand the challenges and keeping up to date with, with the changing targets, you know, and especially in the scientific area. But there's so many questions coming in about your great rewilding project mm -hmm. and um, going back to, again, not causing one problem by you know solving another and causing it another mm -hmm. one just a, a couple of questions are what species of bees are targeted within the action of the great rewilding i will have to come back to you on that one that would be a question for our farms managing director i don't have that answer there apologies been, for that. as i said i can empathize because there's been a lot of confusion over this but i mean again all the a, a number of coming in really questioning the the um the wildflowers, you know, disconnected from the basic principles of plant geography, subverts plant ecology, distorts biogeographical well, evidence, alters. If, 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 I, if I could just say this about the initiative. Um, so we know within our own farms that um, the wildflowers that we plant here in North County Dublin has made a tremendous difference to the quality of our fruit. That, that's a fact. I get that. that yeah. That's a fact, yeah. I get that. And our customers um, who co communicate through us through all sorts of means also have an interest in doing something um, within their own, the realms of their own gardens and are, are, are excited about doing something. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I totally. You, you know, so, so from our perspective, we feel it's better doing something to help our customers deliver on their ambitions and be contribute to biodiversity. And you know, if there was an abundance of um, area specific wildflower seeds that each of the customers could go to, or to area specific, um, that, that's something that we may look at in the future. But right now, what we're looking at is wildflowers seeds that are native to Ireland and that can help our customers think more about biodiversity and in some way contribute to biodiversity within the island of Ireland and, and that's again, what the initiative is trying to do and again Des I totally get that get that because that's the road I've been on for a number of years mm. but I think just a couple of things because the the um it appears the expert opinion now is that it's 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 not it's not good. And the pollinator plan you did mention you were involved in that the pollinator plan message is, is don't so let it grow. And I suppose from from again from the comments coming in the the, the issue seems to be that um, it's not valuing the the the, the local what weeds or whatever that are there. So look at it's just an issue. I think. You know, it's evolving all the time. I think it's an issue that needs to be considered or from the comments coming in there. I can read 
10 more of them there, but uh, it's just the general. I think Kevin, that I would say is, um, I'll take your comments back. We have our own experts also. Yeah. Yeah. And I guarantee if I put two experts on any matter into a room, you'll have two different opinions of what, what, what comes out there, uh, as there is uh, 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 on many different subjects on sustainability. And, you know, we, we'll take our comments back and I'll yeah. feed it back to yeah. our own experts. That's all I can do at this point in time yeah, for no, you. I welcome that. And, 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 and I appreciate it, but it, um, we feel um, that our customers can now help contribute and they've asked for you know they want to do this and it, and it, it's and evident within the request that we're getting for the wildflowers yeah but I, again i yeah listen we'll, we'll probably leave it there i just can read okay. a number of questions and um, come coming back to that one yeah, uh, it's a lot of comments mark you may yeah. maybe summarize them better just, just to make sure we get the yeah. comments back yeah but no no, no there is there's on, definitely moving on to another question des um mm -hmm. Sustainable uh, pr production of food mean it's organic and pesticide free? Um, does it mean it's organic yes, and pesticide are, free? Well, we do organics. And, so, and we do. Total so we do. Um, and, and the reality is the use of pesticides are getting less and less and less and less every single year. And that's just the reality of it. And therefore, um, we operate other methods to, to, to deal with that. But the, the, just over time, that's going to be reduced, you know. There's a topic there, Des, that's coming through and a number of questions in relation to the use of peat um, by, by keelings, given the, the restrictions that are in place now with the use of, of, of or harvesting peat in Ireland. What mm. are your your uh, plans around that? To, to we, 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 that? We, don't, we, we use uh, coconut coir, so we do, which is sustainable. Um, means for 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 our plants. That's what we use. Very good. Well, that's a fairly straightforward response there. Um, Just another question back yeah. on the um, again the uh, again I get it that the the production is increased by the by the pollinators. Are they are your pollinators imported? Do you import bees? Um, again, that's a question I'll take back to our farms managing director. Yeah, okay. Um, if you have any questions like that, I'm happy to take them back to our farms and get a more precise answer. I wouldn't want to answer something that absolutely um, totally I, say, I don't sit on the farms. How has reducing food waste contributed to pro pro sorry, how has reducing food waste contributed to profit margins or affected them negatively? Um How does food waste contribute to improving profit margins? Does it help or does it? It's your so it's really your definition of waste. So when you look, uh, we're, we're, we're responders to, to the initiative champions, uh, I think it's 12.3, which defines what waste is. So surplus food is not defined as waste. So surplus food that we go to, um, say, uh, animal feed would not be considered waste and the vast majority of our surplus food that's not fit for 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 humans to eat for whatever reason would go to and i don't mean that there's, that there's something particularly bad with it i'm just mean it's you know if there's if there's a if they're squashed or something like that you know that the, 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 people won't see it appetizing um goes to animal feed so it's 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 not a it's not a, a profit margin initiative is to ensure that you are, um, if you have surplus food, where that can go in a sustainable manner. And, and we will have surplus food, we'll always have surplus food. So it's not a profit issue. Okay. It was never done for that reason. A question there, what types of energy demand does the business have, heat and electricity, and what renewable options are you considering? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, in terms of energy demands, um, so we as a business, um the vast majority of our you know 50 percent of our energy will be on refrigeration of product product has to be refrigerated and we are currently in the process with we have an energy consultant we do we, we submit our energy report every five years and we have an energy consultant looking at it at the moment and we are looking at alternatives um at this point in time solar pv is one of those 
you know, here in retail, we've pro approximately you know, around about 200,000 square feet of roofs that our production that, that the packing facility sits underneath. And we are looking at solar as one of those options. Now, there's huge challenges with that. Um, you know, when, when you're looking at it, uh, you know, it's, there's, there's, the, the challenge comes about whereby if you're building a building from scratch, you can design it to put solar on top of it. If you have a building here that's 20 years old or 30 years old, you then have to assess whether that building can hold solar panels. And not just the panels, what happens if it snows? You have to ensure that it holds that weight as well. And there's also challenges. We're right beside Dublin Airport. Yeah, so, well, you know, there's a glint and glare study to be considered when you're actually looking at all of this stuff. So there's so many different uh, variables to consider when you're looking, uh, uh, and we do within our project. So we have, we, that's one good example, actually, um, that's currently live at this point in time. But we have a lot of initiatives within the business that reduces energy. You know, we've all LED lighting throughout the organization. We have sensor switches throughout the organization. So if you leave a room and, knock, and nobody else is and knock itself off, we are looking at our heat pumps that use for heat and water and replacing them with more sustainable um, sources. Um, we're looking at um, um, our, our management systems and upgrades to our current refrigeration to ensure they're the most efficient as possible. Um, we're, we're obviously training our people to make them aware. So if they leave a machine, it's knocked off when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're you know, at the end of the evening and so forth and so forth. There's lots of initiatives going on within the organization to help reduce because when we are looking at our operation emissions reduction target for 2030 and that year by 2040, you have to go down through the funnel. You know, you have to get to a set of residual emissions that are, are, are acceptable. And that's the journey we're on at this point in time. There's we have an interesting question there just come in uh, in relation to carbon offsetting and just mm -hmm. wondering what sort of um, uh, offsets, um, offsetting options are you looking at uh, in terms of, you know, to get to that neutral carbon neutral position by 2040? Um, it's an interesting one. Um, ultimately, the one you have to look at is removal. There's many different offsets out there, gold standard offsets, but when you're looking at net zero by 2040 the only thing you can look at is removal uh offsets which would be like supplanting trees uh, with an organization that that does that um as our primary business um and that will be the one so now we've looked at other stuff as well um here in, uh, in ireland and, and the question is when is the right time to do that right now we're focused on reducing as much as possible on that journey and when we get to a point where we feel that we can't do it anymore, that's the point where we then say, okay, now's the time to do the net zero piece and, um, and look at the use of offsets at that point in time. But it's, and, and offsets are continuously changing. The cost of offsets are changing. The, the availability of offsets are changing. But right now, our focus is, is reduce and decarbonization of our of our supply chain and reduce our operational emissions. That's where our focus is at this point in time. Okay, uh, Des, we're we're just up on time. I don't know where that hour went, but I uh, really appreciate your your uh, honesty. I suppose it is it's it's a it's not an easy thing to stand out and put your head above the parapet and say, look, this is what we're doing. So we do applaud you for that, and uh, we want to wish you well. In the next uh, 50 to 100 years and that journey um it is it's it's a challenge for us all but uh look i, I think you're you're making all the right moves and i think uh businesses have have a lot to learn from the the work that you have done so far so uh we do do appreciate uh you, you coming along today catherine thank you so much for uh your help with uh, the questions and just to let you know that next week uh, we'll be speaking to Eamon Meskel, who's the regional manager with National Parks and Wildlife so Southern Division, who's going to be talking about the white-tailed sea eagle reintroduction uh, to Ireland project. 
And so we'll have a number of uh, weeks where we'll be focusing on um, biodiversity type topics. Catherine, you've uh, been instrumental in in uh, organizing some of those. Uh, so we, we do look forward to, to those coming up. And to thank uh, Yvonne Maher for helping with this morning, Andy Boland, uh, who's the series producer. And uh, we want to wish you a lovely weekend and uh, we will see you again at 9.30 next Friday. So Des, thanks again. And You're welcome. And, 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 and thank you week. for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.